Welcome to Connecting with Coincidence with psychiatrist Bernard David Beitman, MD. Dr. Beitman is the founder of The Coincidence Project. The project encourages people like you to tell each other coincidence stories. To learn more about Dr. Beitman's work, put Connecting with Coincidence in your web browser. You'll find his book, his Psychology Today blog, and the interviews from this podcast. And now your host, Bernard Beitman, MD. Welcome to Connecting with Coincidence. Yes, I am your host, uh, Bernard Beitman, MD. I'm a psychiatrist who does psychotherapy. I study meaningful coincidences like synchronicity and serendipity because many of them are useful, particularly in psychotherapy, and their possible explanations provide us to clues about how reality works. I've written a, a new book, came out September 6th. The order links are below, but I suggest you buy from your local bookstore if you can. My discussion today, lead-in discussion, is about something a little different from what I've done before. It's about the collective human organism, or the CHO. Uh, there's a common set of phrases. You've all heard them. We're all in this together, and everything's connected. But how are we all in this together, and how are we connected? Coincidences can help us answer some of those questions. The something greater that we're part of can be conceptualized as the collective human organism, with each person functioning as a cell in this organism. The idea begins to answer the question about how each of us is a part of the greater whole. Meaningful coincidences illuminate the invisible threads that connect us to each other and to our environment and to other living creatures surrounding us. They highlight our shared mental and emotional participation in the psychosphere, which is our mental atmosphere. They also help pave the way to crystallizing the unique gift each person brings to their participation in the CHO by sharpening your own identity while illuminating your connections to others through these invisible currents highlighted by meaningful coincidences. The CHO may be imagined in human form to stride our planet with its head in the clouds, its mind connected to the higher self in the psychosphere, its feet, its feet moving with roots through the ground. Currently, these big feet are stomping out the life of many living individuals, and those big hands are selfishly grabbing resources with little regard for our habitat. We are slowly, as humanity, committing suicide. Our guest today and I will discuss what we might do about this gradual suicide attempt by our CHO. Daniel Madelon is the founder of an amazing group, the Is There Enough? And it's a campaign, a global conversation about survival economics and social issues. He is also the co-founder and CEO of a social impact venture studio called Impact Launchpad. These two organizations are working together on a response to the idea of the world game. The world game, a challenge laid out by the 20th century design scientist Buckminster Fuller. He's known, Bucky is known mostly for his geodesic domes, just build it, it stays strong and firm out there anywhere, but he's perhaps lesser known, but it should be worth noting for the focus of the audience, for our audience today, as the man who defined the mathematics of synergy. And Dan and I are gonna be talking about synergy and meaningful coincidences. So welcome to the show, Dan. It's great that we finally made our connection. Dr. Bernard, it's such a pleasure to have the opportunity to talk to you about where our various perspectives intersect and that's something of a meaningful coincidence in and of itself and I think one of the things we should get to right at the beginning one of the little uh, noted 
aspects of synergy that Buckminster Fuller talked about is not just the uh, sum being great, the whole being greater than the sum of the parts, which most of us know, kind of like everything is connected, like you were saying, but to dig deeper into it, it's actually unpredictable by those parts as well. So who knows what will come out of your and my connection today for your audience. So. Well, I assume that you're like me and we like, we like to see what happens when we push around something and, sure. and see what comes out. I mean, it's just fun to do that. Uh, and, and that's, uh, that's a whole idea of chaos and complexity is that you can't predict outcomes a lot of times. You just put it together and see what happens. So we're going to see what happens today. So could you could you start uh, then with talking about synergy and synchronicity, meaningful coincidences and synergy, just so that we can get to the details of how you use synergy and meaningful coincidences, it sounds to me, in making things happen from your perspective. This might not be the place you'd expect me to start from, but I'm focusing on the word meaningful in that sentence. Great. Um, and I think that, you know, uh, from Viktor Frankl and everybody, you know, in that body of thought after in man's search for meaning, Buckminster Fuller had some things to say about that too. And even the present CEO of the Buckminster Fuller Institute, Tom Chi, who's quite an eminent guy in his own right, has something to say about this as well, which, Bucky used to put it this way. He would say, uh, the bee doesn't know that it's cross-pollinating, which is its purpose. It only knows that it's chasing honey. He, at his time, he said, human beings are largely money honey seeking bees. And their true purpose is that 90 degrees in a 360 degree aspect that I don't have the mathematical skills to convey, but it had something to do with defining the ripple effect. He didn't just define synergy and some aspects of synchronicity, but he actually defined what we call the ripple effect in mathematical terms. He called it precession, which is like procession with an E instead of an O. And in defining that, he would say that if you really want to know what is meaningful, he said, look at the ripples around you and you know what meaning you're creating. It's not necessarily what we think we're doing. It's usually the ripples that are flowing out from what we're doing. That's a great uh, image. And we need, an ex we need some examples from you. Well, our story is kind of an interesting example of that in this way, which is um, Impact Launchpad as the venture studio that it is, which is a for-profit social impact development company, uh, accelerator, incubator for projects that we deem as supporting human survival <laughs> as defined by the 17 sustainable development goals and other sorts of measures. Well, that's a really important what you're saying. Uh, and which could you just elaborate on on that? Well, you look for people who are doing what? So uh, I and thousands and thousands of colleagues, legions of people around the world have created an industry which we today call social impact investing. When I was first studying Buckminster Fuller from some of his students who were my teachers, so I'm sort of a grandson intellectually of Buckminster Fuller in that lineage. Nice. Um, we, we, we just called it social entrepreneurship. And the idea was it would be possible to entrepreneurially address problems that the world has and turn it into a business and actually profit from that, uh, which, you know, some people on, um, on my left uh, 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 shudder at to the idea that anything capitalism could be positive to humanity's survival. But there is an industry that's grown out of what we call ESG to become more proactive social impact investing. So to actually even commission uh, the search for certain technologies that can address certain problems. And what we have found most of all is that there's a lot of available technology that's simply not being implemented for other reasons that have to do with what we think the core issue is of human survival, which is a lack of collaboration and agreement to address our challenges. And because those seem so difficult, we end up fighting each other or because we fight each other, we don't see what actually is possible to do about those things. So well, you're, you're really right where I'm talking uh, mm -hmm. is I, I, would, I did a podcast yesterday with uh, some guys and they wanted to just keep talk about UFOs or at least the main guy did. And I was trying to suggest that you've got a perspective. I have a perspective. There are other people who have a perspective and we're each having potential contributions to what this thing is that we need to do. 
but he wanted to fight and say, my idea is the most important one. And you have seen that time and time again. I am a psychiatrist who tries to do something with relationships. So you are a, a bridge builder, I'm assuming, from what you're telling me. So finding ways to be able to get, oh, I'm the right one, you got to do my way. I know the rest, way, but, but I'm not paying attention to what you're thinking about, because I know what I'm thinking about. To get to reduce that is part of what you're talking about. And I think meaningful coincidences can help that to happen. Oh, I absolutely agree. I think that the very concept of meaningful coincidence sort of really puts some muster into what a coincidence is all about in the first place, which is why I focused on it right away. And we're very active on Clubhouse for those of your audience uh, who are active on Clubhouse and want to engage with us. And I deliberately put myself in rooms with people who think very differently than I like there are people, as you know, who are very fearful of any global cooperation means that the globalists will come in and sort of take over their town sort of thing. And I'm a guy who's devoted to Buckminster Fuller's world game concept, not a world order, perhaps, but a world game, which is a little more grassroots and a lot less powers that be sort of thinking. What can we as individuals do? That's what Buckminster Fuller proposed. What can each of us individually do with respect to the world game? And I put myself in rooms where people go, oh my God, you're a globalist, you know, and I'm actually willing to talk to them. And, uh, and uh, you know, there's been some understanding, let's say, that's come out of that, that things are not as necessarily bad as they seem. Sometimes they're worse in certain areas, but they're actually certain things that are actually working in the world that we're not paying attention to because as the Gapminder, gapminder.org for people who want to look up their work, as the Gapminder Foundation says, human beings love their drama as much as salt and sugar. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Psychiatrist, right? And and what are the, what are the things? <laughs> yeah. And that means getting scared, like going to a horror movie. Well, you know, I will say this. I mean, we're doing a lot of and we haven't introduced it in this conversation yet because you're asking sort of where was the coincidence in and, and understanding the, the ripple effect. Um, as we were proposing some of the concepts of social impact investing, we were really interested in and aligning of investors in some new concepts of how to grow that business. In exasperation, one day I went, isn't there enough? And the room just stopped. It was just one of those moments, you know, like in a movie where all the bodies stop and you can move around. Yeah, it was yeah, a yeah. <laughs> feeling. And two weeks later, I mean, I was doing okay at the time, but two weeks later, I was invited into a room with 50 ambassadors on an expensive veranda and, and nobody had been paying attention to me on that level before. It was literally like a, a black and white difference in my world. And three months later, I was on a world tour that took me to 22 countries in 2019 talking about the conversation of what enough is not scarcity and abundance but what enough is beautiful. Is really, beautiful yeah it's very unique to it is very unique it is unique to each person we've done thousands of hours of testing on this conversation in these 22 countries hundreds of hours uh, thousands of hours and and what this conversation of asking the question is there enough tends towards more collaboration than conflict. So you want to talk about dropping a stone in the water and looking at the ripples. If you're engaging in certain conversation and all it's getting you is a bunch of conflict, you might want to think about a different kind of conversation. Yes. And I'm speaking for the human organism, if I may, you and I may deign to, to put ourselves in that perspective to do that, is there is a conversation of collaboration which requires conscious attention that without that conscious attention, we drift into conflict and war almost automatically. As a conscious, atten conscious attention to what? To, for example, we have on our website, isthereenough.org, what we call the core conversations. One of these core conversations is to practice starting with sameness before difference. Yeah. In other words, your discussion you were just referring to, that guy who thinks he has the best way to do X or Y and everybody else is an idiot, which is a very common conversation about highly intelligent people who can't put up with people who don't understand them and they wonder why they can't get anything done, right? Um, I deal with geniuses all day long, so I love them and also, you know, put up with them, right? And, uh, and uh, so, so I think that um, if someone who had superior attention to a, an innovation could start with 
well, you know, you and I agree on this outcome and this and this and this. Now let me give you what my unique contribution is to that. They have far more capability of bringing collaboration, agreement, and attention to that than they do with like, you're stupid and I'm smart, which is essentially what that conversation boils down to. Oh, I have to do that as a psychotherapist pretty regularly. I have to, I have to be able to see who I'm talking with and have that person listen. And I listen to that person. So I go to that person and then that helps the person be able to hear what I might have to say that might be useful to them. And I would ask you as a professional, it's, is it just as true that you have to do that with somebody who's completely delusional as somebody who just has a few, you know, anxiety issues, you still have to meet them where they are. Do you not? I, I, I was up for quite a while with many phone conversation with a guy who knew he was being tracked, that people were doing stuff to him and his, his, his family and his friends wanted him in the hospital and they put him in the hospital. I didn't, but I kept staying with him for about four or five months and believed what he was talking about. Now, there were some delusional aspects to it, but I was able to get that with him. But I stayed with him. I was about the only person, another friend who kind of did, who stayed with him. It was a lot of work, I'll tell you, to stay with his, his very large delusional system, but it wasn't. There was some truth to it. And that's what I had to do. And that's what you're saying has to be done. You have to go where the person is. And sometimes it ain't no fun. No, it isn't fun. And it's very meaningful, regardless of the fact of how difficult it can be and how much sometimes it's not fun. Um, and yes. I believe that you and I agree from our conversation before this conversation, human survival depends on this. Human survival is depending on, this is where you and I are beginning to resonate actually in actuality. I saw that in what you've written, but in actuality that a lot of people don't want to notice this don't want to notice that we got a problem here. I, I, I think that but what I've come to is that there's certainly people who don't want to know about it, but there's a larger group even than those who know that there's something about this, but don't feel that there's anything they can do about it as a single individual. Thank you, because I'm coming to realize that myself. Um, but there's a, the, the, the news organizations don't pay much attention to it. At least I heard uh, a number from a, a person studying the weather that this hurricane Ian that we've got is got fifty is got forty percent more rain in it because of global warming, uh, because warm air holds more water, for example, and that is showing economic destruction. So at least there's a mention on the me on the media of that happening. Oh, there's definitely plenty in both mainstream and alternative media, and I'm going to group them all together because I'm a media guy as well, and I think that we have more power in the palm of our hand, you know, you can't see it on my virtual there, and, it's, and my phone, uh, than Walter Cronkite had on his best day, right? Uh -huh. We're all journalists now, right? Here uh, we yeah, are that's, doing that's a, true. Right? That's true. Well, yeah. what, what, what we're coming together, but what I need you to do for this podcast is to come to me now a little bit more and back to you about meaningful coincidences centered and synergy and the ripple effects that you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, you had asked me this question from my own experience, and I was relating the story that we intended to create this thing called Impact Launchpad, for those who are seeing me on video. Um, what we didn't expect to is this nonprofit and this global conversation called Is There Enough to Exist? That happened by accident. And when it did, it became the focal point that brought us the influence to be able to convene the parties together to agree on what Impact Launchpad was a pipe okay, dream. Because, because I'm the guy you're talking to right now, this by accident thing, <laughs> I want to hear... I want to hear more about that because uh, that's serendipity that uh, you just described a happy accident and that these accidents are like running into something by mistake or who knows how or making a wrong turn or coming. How did it happen that you went from the one to the other? So as I expressed, I uttered this question in a slightly different form than the way we trademarked it as is there enough hashtag is there enough. And the effect on my life was so dramatic and people paying attention 
to the things that I thought needed attention and gaining me influence and even financial benefits that I, you know, I'm happy to receive along the way. Um, and I went from somewhat obscurity to, let's say, a little bit of influence as a result of this conversation. I'm one of these guys that goes, well, if a little is good, let's try a little bit more. Yeah. <laughs> Right. And because the seeds of all these ideas go back 30 years, I went to a workshop that's called Money and You, moneyandyou.com for anyone who wants to check it out. Not very well known in America, but very much so in Australia, Asia and other parts of the world that takes Buckminster Fuller's work and puts it in an entrepreneurial perspective through an entrepreneurial lens. And it was started by students of Buckminster Fuller who were ex hippies who were becoming business people and wanted to figure out how to bring their aspects of social change. I'm familiar with that. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, that. and so this, these things were percolating in me for 30 years, uh, but I didn't really come to any recognition of how to use it to the degree that I am until I started putting in the form of a question, right? Because I was telling people for 30 years that there's enough and I got a little bit of attention for that. Um, but the moment I put it into a question, it became the responsibility of the listener, ah. as opposed to me lecturing them on why they should wake up to the abundance that exists in universe, which it does, and put the focus then on us and how we badly translate abundance into scarcity, which is the real truth that I see. Um, and I'm speaking from a perspective of economics here, and you can understand like there are some economists who do not like my conversation much uh, because economics has always been and never been questioned just to be the study of the allocation of scarcity scarcity That's good economics. economics has been the study of the allocation of scarcity good that's and that's what you over 30 years gradually dribbled into your ability to think sharply about it a question is there enough meaning you implying so many questions imply an answer yeah there is enough is what's what's implied in that question so you're telling them in a question an opinion but you're making them have to challenge it with you so well, if I'm I, I i thought of it that way myself oh isn't this inventive that i found a, a cute way to do this until people started coming back to me with other kinds of responses to this than I expected. So you want to talk about meaningful coincidence, try this one on for size. I'm ready. The most, the most common response across the globe to the conversation of is there enough is am I enough? Am I enough? Followed by are we enough? Sometimes to even a nation's identity, right? very heady stuff to start to think about the intersection between the way I was looking at it is available resources, spaceship earth, we're all in this together, we're all connected, all of that stuff. And people have reinterpreted this conversation, not just to making the world work for 100% of humanity, which by the way, is the world game with a few conditions attached to it for people who have not heard it before and are listening to us for the first time, how to make the world work for 100% of humanity. Um, but some people have largely reinterpreted our conversation of how do I use this to make the world work for 100% of my world? Never mind the world, because the world's too much for me to take on, right? And that's understandable uh, in that perspective. And so it has, uh, as a byproduct, not as an intention, as a ripple, some people are using our conversation to become better at the real human resource we think we're missing, which is enough agreement and collaboration. So if you're a salesperson, a negotiator, a teacher, a parent, it's not gonna matter, like your life depends, your life depends on your ability to make agreement in the world. And we are kind of like an agreement academy at this point, a very pop kind of agreement academy. It's not Harvard negotiation or something like that. It's about how to stimulate a conversation of two human beings asking each other what enough is. Can you imagine a, a relationship being impacted positively by that question um, or uncovering dysfunctions out of that? And I mean, it has a broad application in a very pop way. So when you talk about the ripples, both my financial circumstances improve, my relationships improve, my real wealth, not just money, but wealth, as Buckminster Fuller uh, liked to define wealth, um, uh, my real wealth personally increased as a result of having this conversation. So if a little bit is good, more is better. And the more attention I paid on this conversation, the more influence I've lined up for a very grand ambition of a global bank for social impact that nobody owns and nobody has to fight over. 
That's a real thing. Well, the question I have in the midst of this, because I, I tend to look at details of interaction and words, is, the, is, is there enough means a lot of different things to different people because the word enough is a Rorschach test of like uh, with a big question mark on the word enough, not just the question itself, but what do you mean by enough? And I really respect the idea that there isn't enough of cooperation and agreement, even intent to have that happen. Start with a family, start with a couple, how often the two of them can't get along with each other. So what I try to study is how can we say to you, how can I say to you, Dan, do you want to work on this relationship with me? And you might say, I don't know. You might say, okay, let's see what happens. And then I say, okay, well, I would like to work on this relationship with you. I would like to have a better relationship with you. I would like to have a connection with you. I just met you. So I say, well, it's very, it, so I would like to do it too. So do you want to have uh, an increase of a connection with me? Becomes a Yes, question. I do. Yes, but, I do. Whether we do it or not is something else, but, that's, but we can act it out. I hope we do it. So if we do want to have, a better connection between you and me if we want to then we're agreeing that we want to have a connection and that's a first necessary step to me you, you've said two things in here i can't let go even though i don't mean to interrupt you is the, oh, the is book we're writing about all this is called the first agreement you've just gone through basically the, the 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 essence of it is let's have a first agreement and then let's go to the next one. And if we fail at that, we can go back to the last one and start again. And it's, it's kind of this um, foundational expression of values and even obvious ones. Like we've, we've moderated conversations between people about abortion that are quite exciting and interesting. Wow. Yeah. Um, and we have brought people together who vociferously disagree about policy related to abortion. And we've had them be able to eke out a few agreements that both sides actually do respect human life, but they actually have a different interpretation about whose life is a priority, whether it's the mother's or the unborn child. If the, trick there, the trick there to me is that you that they were willing to come together with someone who had an opposing point of view. I mean, that, that's, that's, a, that's, that, that's a subset. That's a subset in a way uh, that brings us to the subject of incentive, right? Because awareness is one way to bring people into bigger conversations of consequence and waking people up. And then we get to the place where the idea of wakeness is wokeness is actually a bad thing. And I think we, we have, uh, uh, 70 years of human transformational literature of one kind or another, you know, a lot of your, your corner of the, of the intellectual uh, world in that, that speaks about awareness and consciousness. A and I love all that stuff. I have a lot of teachers, you know, who have learned from that, but uh, not quite very much on demonstration. Awareness plus demonstration equals transformation. Without the demonstration, there isn't any. And, I, yeah, 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 yeah. Right? right? And that's why you get people who read all the books and they've been to every seminar, and yet they're still dealing with that same pattern. A lot of times what we're really lacking when you want to talk about is there enough something, how about is there enough courage? Is there enough safety for people to practice experimentation? You know, do we, can we build a culture where we look at experimentation and risk-taking as a value, not only whether you win or lose. This is a critical issue also, right? And so all of these things are linguistic perforations of some of these bubbles that we live in that, that are looking to provoke, this is what I was trying to say earlier, it's not like I'm doing an inventive way to get people to see that there's enough. I'm literally now at that point where I don't really mind if you don't think there's enough where you do. I just want you to question it. Well, you've, and, you've, you've questioned what enough of what? 
Well, this is what happens when we teach people how to have the conversation of is there enough, which we're now doing. And we have like a formal academy for this where people can earn a certificate and all that just takes about 10 hours. It's kind of a product now. Wow. Uh, and when these people conduct this social research with us, we teach them when you ask someone what enough, uh, whether there's enough, someone will usually say enough what? Like you haven't finished the conversation and we go, you tell me. There's a recorded version of this, somebody doing it organically with me on a on a on a, a clubhouse and um and whatever that person answers after you say you tell me is their values whatever they go to when you say you tell me is what they consider most scarce in the world wow right? wow, yeah. wow yeah yeah so we can actually inspire people to examine what we'd want them to examine if they studied Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but without having to teach all that, because I've had this conversation with five-year-olds in an age-appropriate way, and it went much more successfully than I had even hoped. Um, and so uh, the examination of what enough is, like you said earlier, is a Rorschach test. I tell people it's you, as unique as a fingerprint. And when I show you sometime later, we'll, we'll look at the data and I'll show you the responses of people to our survey and people listening to me can do this for themselves. They can go to is there and they'll prominently see our survey there. And it's our argument for in the process of asking people what there's enough of, what there's not enough of that whole Rorschach test thing. And then we go, doesn't it make sense that the real question here isn't, is there enough, but what are we going to do about it? And the it in that sentence is whatever we agree that there's not enough of. So if you and I agree that there's not enough courage, okay, let's focus on that. What could we do about it? And at the end of the day, we could go, well, we could legislate how people think about courage, which is war, or we could think about how to stimulate people examining what the heck courage even is. I mean, is it different than bravery? I actually think it is. Uh, I learned from Money and You 30 years ago that courage is commitment plus doubt plus action. People go, doubt? Yes, it's not courage if you don't have any doubt. <laughs> there's, no, there's no courage in that at all, right? And when you wanna talk about meaningful coincidences, I, 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 would get, I would bet that there are several people you've interviewed that you've asked about their own moments of insight have come after an expression of courage. That's right. Uh I'm, I don't know if I'm simpler than you are um, in the way I think about this, uh, but I do come at it from a psychotherapeutic perspective. I've written a couple of books on psychotherapy, and I look at the problem of change. How do you help people change? And one of the favorite psychiatric uh, or psychotherapy ideas of mine is how many psychiatrists does it take to change a light bulb? <laughs> What do you think? Oh, I, I'm waiting for your punchline. Well, I, I, I like, I, is there enough of, of an answer from you? I mean, I, I like to get answers from people if they, were, if will, if they have the courage to, uh, well, to offer I, one. I, I, yeah, I don't think it takes any myself, <laughs> right? Because I think that, uh, and I'm very influenced uh, by a dear friend of mine who's no longer with us by the name of Ken Wines, who... I would venture has uh, one of the greatest transformation stories any of us will ever hear. And I'm gonna do a movie about him someday. Um, and Ken uh, was a career criminal facing 23 years of sentence with no possibility of parole. He was in Marion, Illinois where John Gotti died and he was determined to escape. And instead of escaping him and Martin Broder who was a transactional psychologist doing something of a draft dodging furlough inside the prison coincidentally came together and created an extraordinary happening in the, in the annals of the, the history of, uh, of American prison systems. And they created a non-prison inside the prison while he was still a prisoner. And they ended up uh, commuting his sentence and sending him out into the world because he didn't need to be in prison anymore. And, and what Ken said to me was, you talk about the world game, his program was called The Game, meaning the game of life. He said that uh, part of his transformation began when he just accepted his circumstances. When he embraced, which I hear you saying in your book, when he embraced what is before we get to how we'd like things to be. 
that was what gave him the clarity. We, we don't put enough attention on the power of clarity. Um, it gave him the clarity to understand incrementally what he could do. And when he saw incrementally what he could do, it led to other people replicating his incrementalism. And eventually it just became an extraordinary wave, you know, a set of ripples that happened from. So I've, I've always taken a, a great deal of embrace of transformation is sometimes just being with what is not change at all. That's a transformation. For That's transformation, people. except what is. And then I'm an incrementalist too. I've gone from uh, a, a several meaningful coincidences to talking with you now and the books that are there by having it all build up. But back to my question, how many psychiatrists does it take to change a light bulb? Uh, you, you're, you're touching on, a, on the answer to that. Uh, it, only, it only takes one, but really the light bulb has to want to change. That's what you just described. And mm -hmm. the process of change has been described as, I don't need to change, pre-contemplation, there's no, nothing wrong with me. Contemplation, meaning looking at the pattern, which is accepting what is, then initiating change, which takes courage to be able to do, and an environment to be able to do it, and then maintaining the change. Those are all sequences of the process of change, which you are describing yet in more detail than uh, other people do in a different way. But it's still the process that I hear you describing, going from recognizing the pattern, being aware of it, initiating the change. You have to give up the old one sometimes, like a bad habit you've got in order to start the new one, and then you start the new one. And, and let me insert another set of realizations in the ripple effect of this is there enough question asking you know is there enough what and so on and so forth um the recognition here is that just asking a question and which question it actually is is what starts this process let me it tell really, you what I yes go ahead um, when I realized that is there enough was more than just something I was exasperatingly uttering and was a thing that people wanted to talk about a lot, um, I went to register the hashtag is there enough. And I'm a tech guy from my background as a business analyst, so I should know this, but I didn't realize that I couldn't put a question mark in a hashtag. Can't put it in a domain name. Can't put it in an email address. Question marks are considered special characters. They're not part of our online conversation to the same degree that our uh, assertions are. And why do we think that our online conversation is so much more vitriolic than it is in real life? And we say basically that justice, wealth, um, inequality, and climate change are all dependent on our ability to collaborate and make agreement but you would not, and I'm talking new agreement, right? It's no trick to get agreement with somebody who already agrees with your opinion. You know, you're not getting any prizes for that. How do you sit down with someone who has a completely different perspective, but still a vested interest in a goal that you could share, a value you could share, just like those people in the abortion conversation. And also this even points to people who are what we call selfish oriented and others who are societal oriented and we've obviously evolved different sorts of brains and different sorts of focuses like that so the idea we're going to propose something that everybody has to just become other oriented and altruistic and the rest of them that are not are just not grown up like we are is an inadvertent war between the conscious and the not conscious what we've learned from blockchain technology which is a governance system that has incentives and disincentives that are built into it. We've discovered that having a high purpose for a blockchain community that doesn't have a personal incentive in it will fail. It has to work at the personal level. And so what we feel that people are welcome in the conversation of is there enough is if you just want to use our conversation to get ahead in life, go to it. <laughs> like You've got incentive, just make your own world work better than it did yesterday, make it less conflict oriented and more constructing oriented. And those of us that see that we have a desire to make that impact on the entire human race, like you and I do, 
I mean, who's to say they're better and you're better and you know what I mean? We're all doing our own individual contribution to that if we are committed to growing the pie instead of destroying it and dividing it up amongst limited resources. A key, it's key, a important question. idea right there. Mm -hmm. Let me, let me, let's step back for a minute here, Dan. Um, uh, I, I'm getting uh, an interesting feeling uh, in this conversation with you. And I've had it before. It's more subtle. But you have a lot of messages to deliver. Uh, and you have some great ideas uh, with Buckminster Fuller. I like this prison story is the is the is one that really clicks with me because that's about what I'm interested in. But you have continued to bypass my interest in meaningful coincidences. I'm feeling more and more like I'm just an audience for you. Not that I that we are in a collaborative discussion where I think maybe I have something to offer as well. It's uh, it's been all about your many wonderful ideas, which I respect and I'm glad to hear about. But the relationship between us is getting into a, an up down one. And I thought I would mention that to you because I don't like it. I appreciate you saying so and putting us back on course. I'm I'm in your hands. Tell tell me how you'd like. I us want to you to respond to what I just said, please. That that's too uh, passive. I, I need to have your what your experience of this is too, because that's the way we do collaboration. You know this as well as I do. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you how I'm feeling. You need to tell me how you're feeling about what I just said. Um, I'm feeling disappointed that. Um, <clears throat> that we're not able to thus far have met what our expectations are for this. So I'm interested in, in fulfilling that. And uh, so, so I'm, I'm open to shifting this conversation towards that direction. I, I, I can, we can do that, but I already gave you what I was interested in talking about that CHO and the place that meaningful coincidence can play in it. And the prison story you told me is part of that. That's the, to me, the best example so far, but also the right finding the right circumstances for you to ask the question with the ambassadors is part of that too. And you've got a lot of good information. I really respect what you're doing. Thank you. And I hope we can find a way to, to work together. But I'm telling I'm just telling you that there's a dominance in your way of talking to me today. Uh, that has an element of I'm right, and I know what I'm talking about, and I've got some good answers here that is an anathema to what you're saying you'd like to be able to do. So I'm asking you to address at least what I'm thinking is a contradiction between what you're saying and the way you're acting with me. Yeah, <clears throat> uh, I think it's an interesting paradox that I would experience, maybe not quite a contradiction, um, because when you talk about the human organism as a unit, um, I think that what I am trying to say about a personal incentive as well as an awareness is really what allows us to get to 100%, right? And when you talk about the, the collective human organism, that's what I think about, is about 100% of humanity. And I think that what could help us get there is if we did a little less distancing of others who don't agree with us, who are just interested in their own self-interest, how are they part of the collective? Oh, I, agree. I, I strongly agree with you. But this is a process comment, Dan. This is not about the content. This is about you and me. Mm -hmm. This is not about you answered with content there. And there is some overlap. And that's why this is so much fun and important for us to be talking about. But yeah. I'm talking about the very thing that I mentioned earlier of somebody who knew he was right and had the right thing and was diminishing my participation, my potential contribution into the in the dialogue. That's what I am talking about. It's a process thing that you very well know, I think. So I'm asking you to join me observe with me what's going on between us, which I'm trying to say from my relationship, I'm saying, I'm trying to ask you, which, how are you reacting to me? You, that's, that's what I'm asking you. About. Uh, you know, when you ask me this, uh, what I am experiencing is that we, as human beings, uh, here's an example of two people with similar aims and objectives. 
And we have to mine some friction and disagreement sometimes in order to mine some agreement. Yes. So that's what goes on for me when you bring this up. To me, I think that you're sincerely and authentically expressing your discomfort might be too strong a word, but something of a feeling you're having. Surprise, really. Yeah, which is a co- <laughs> which is maybe an example of what happens in synergy is some discovery and, and not always good ones. But, but I think, uh, you know, what, what is uh, fascinating and interesting is to realize that most people like in this situation, like you and I are in, would shy away from it and put on a performance and they wouldn't meet it head on. You've brought it up. I'm here responding to it as best I can in the moment and hopefully we can mine some greater alignment and agreement out of the way we make it safe for each other to express ourselves. I'm going to try one more time. I, you're saying all the things that I think are contextually correct. I'm telling you how I am reacting to you, Dan. I just told you that several different times. How are you reacting to what I just said personally, you? That's I what, that's I'm what I'm at. Yeah, I said that I'm disappointed and I'm also curious. That's how I'm responding. Okay, good, 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 good. Um, because you seem like a guy that would do well with being able to do process, what I call process comments about stuff like this, right? Yeah, I love it. You love it. It's, it's, even, when it's, I don't, even when I don't find it comfortable, I still love it. Well, that's when it's really, you really get someplace. And that's why I wanted to bring it up with you because I thought we could get someplace with it because mm -hmm. you talk about it, but here it's happened. Mm -hmm. but I, so I get to ask you, how come you appear, and this it could be all me, how come you appear to be so relatively uninterested in your comments in the perspective I'm trying to bring in, not just the CHO, but the meaningful coincidence part of this. You mentioned them, but it it doesn't it it doesn't become something that you're addressing very much. And I can I'd like to know maybe it isn't that important to you. And that's what I want to be clear about. Well, I'm going to tell you why it is important to me and from reading your book why I was eager to have this conversation because I see a connection between synergy and synchronicity. Yeah, and I want to hear more about that. And, um, you know, I think a lot of conflict is reviewing how we got here and that process thing you're talking about. We break down, well, I said this and you said this, and didn't you notice I said that and so on. It doesn't really move us forward for what we want to talk about, right? And, uh, but I can go back and point out that when you asked me about how in your life did this make a difference. I gave you a story of a ripple effect that I was trying to build a business uh, uh, solution to human survival. And I ended up with a conversational one. And the conversational one actually created the ability to actually deliver on that business idea. And that's a pretty meaningful expression in my life of everything that you're writing about. So that was me answering that question. Okay, so uh, because we don't have that much time left, what I'm hearing from you is that you're in from your perspective, you have, ad you have addressed some of the things that I'm interested, in. I'm very interested in what you're talking about. No, no question about what you're talking about is very important for humanity. And I'm delighted to be able to have this discussion with you. But from your perspective, not from mine, but from your perspective, you have responded to my interest in meaningful coincidences, correct? Yes. Okay. There we have a difference and we'll just leave it for that. No, but because you take it further, you know, and, and dig further into what it is you'd like me to respond to if you feel I have not responded to, because I thought you, I did. You have had so many interactions with so many people and made so many things happen that there have to be yet many of these meaningful coincidences happening to you. And for me, a way to understand you in the context of this show is to be able to hear more about those, um, those happy elements. To give you another one. I'll be happy to give you another one. So, uh, and see if this addresses uh, what you're asking and let me know if it doesn't. Um, when I discovered that agreement was much more than I thought it was. And I told myself I was gonna teach myself agreement like as if, if I was an alien. I went out and interviewed Trump supporters, which you know, 
Trump supporters were as far away from me in ideology as possible. And partly because I actually met Mr. Trump before he was a politician and I had my own feelings about him. So no disrespect to people who love Mr. Trump. I have many friends who are. Um, and when I uh, went and interviewed these people and asked them variations of the question of, is there enough? I learned a great deal, but I also ended up falling in love with one of those people. Um, who is quite an articulate spokesperson for everything about this conversation and is actually the president of the nonprofit that we formed out of Is There Enough? And uh, that has brought a perspective of a ripple effect on global conversation because on the global conversation, there's not very many conservatives that are involved in that. Um, and there's a missing voice of conservatism in the survival of humanity as a human race because much of it has devolved into nationalism um, and proudly so by my many people who feel that that's what conservatism is. So that's had a global impact as a result of me just doing a little social research on what can I do to find agreement with people I don't agree with? Well, let's find some Trump supporters. And that was all the ripples from that. Great. I mean, that's the, I love those stories. What, is, what that tells our, our audience uh, is the dog that trots about finds a bone and you kept moving around and you found a really good connection with someone who is key to your program. Yeah, that, that, I, I just like those stories. And one of the things that you emphasize is the need to tell each other stories. That's one of, the, that's one of your ideas to be able to do from what I can tell. <clears throat> we think we're one of several thousand flowers blooming out there that are attempting to write a new human story of the future. Not one of, we're going off a cliff. <laughs> And let's fight each other in between for what's little left. That's the story most of us are living in. But how do we create a story of human beings uh, surviving over our adversity together? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, you have such a wonderful message. And I, I took the, for me, a bit of a risk to try to tell you about how I was reacting to you, because I think you have a great set of ideas that we all have to pay attention to. And all, all I'm asking is kind of in this little, this little thing that I have, which is, I understand, um, meaningful coincidences. How does that fit in what you're doing? And that's all. I would like to answer that directly and uh, make this offer to you right here on camera. Um, we are evolving right now. And I mean, with in the last month or two from generically and generally asking this Rorschach test that you called it to, to applying the is there enough uh, hashtag to another hashtag like we talked about courage before and we did water so when we did is there enough water we brought water experts together about how to generate water for the planet and all of that um, I would invite you to consider joining us leading a conversation called is there enough which one of those words that you uh, might put to it, you know, the, the, the CHO, uh, or it could be synchron synchronicity itself, is there enough synchronicity, would be a very interesting conversation because it takes the uh, lens of the possibility thinking that is there enough automatically puts into it, and then it directs it like a laser focus on that particular subject. And so we have somebody who's an historian doing is there enough history, we have somebody who's a legacy expert doing Is There Enough Legacy, and we're providing them with some tools and resources to put content out on there uh, like that, including some writing assistance and things like that. And if you found interest enough in the use of the platform of Is There Enough to put focus and maybe build new audiences around that, you, you are very invited to come in and do that. And anybody listening to us now is invited to consider doing that as well. I accept your invitation. Okay. I'm, I'm one of the audience listening to you right now. Uh, I accept your invitation. Uh, I am the founder of the Coincidence Project, and we have a board that's a, it's a nonprofit, just got going. We're looking for money to be able to get this thing going, and we're looking for a broader audience. And this can be something that I can present to our board meeting pretty soon to see if we want to do something, which word to use. Uh, just from your perspective, we have three of them, serendipity, synchronicity, and meaningful coincidences. Which one would you suggest we pick? Meaningful coincidences, I think, would have the broadest accessibility to people of all different walks and shapes and sizes. That's, I think it would be a very stimulating conversation. That's why I titled the book Meaningful Coincidences. Because it has a broader, 
it's not so as serendipity and synchronicity can be. So uh, consider me signed up with a hashtag uh, meaningful coincidence. Is there enough? Is there enough meaningful coincidence? And uh, we'll talk offline about uh, where we proceed with that because this. <clears throat> Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. you Go ahead. I was just going to say that uh, it, it, it's not uh, uh, an exclusive. Somebody else might go, I don't really like what Dr. Bernard says about meaningful coincidences. I want to do my own meaningful coincidences and respond to what he did. And, and that's plenty. Of, and you could say, yeah, we're doing meaningful coincidences in October, but it's going to be serendipity in January or whatever. So it's it's very fluid thing. It's just a matter of whatever you want to focus on with that conversation. Well, I have to know how... how how you how you put these hashtags out there what the process is that you you put a very it sounds like a lot of them how many do you have about 100 of them maybe or more well in our internally we do have about 100 or more that we experiment with and then leaders who've shown up to officially say i want to take that on that's less than a dozen so far and there's a lot, fair bit of attention and work and development that's going into those dozen almost dozen um, and we are releasing, um, and this does not have to be part of you necessarily or any of them, but most of them are also going to become ambassadors for the treaty that we're releasing to the world in 2023, uh, which is a treaty of humanity, not nations. And uh, they will, maybe you'll want to have one or two of them on your podcast to talk about why they would endorse this treaty in the way that they are. And the question really comes down to, would your world be better in terms of the focus of, is there enough meaningful coincidences, for example, if you were working with a culture that was more valuing agreement than war and conflict? Well, that's what our treaty is about. And that's what I'm all about. Yeah. We'd welcome your voice in that and your leadership in that. Well, I'm, I'm there and you'll somehow tell me what the process is for, for what we've just started that we'll have to do uh, to actualize it? The, the, the beginning step of this, besides choosing a category, uh, is honestly to uh, go out and conduct the conversation is there enough for yourself so it can both validate what you expect, but also what coincidences and surprises may come out of that conversation. Um, and it's about a 10 hour exercise. We have an intro interview and exit interview. Um, and we show people how to have that conversation because when you're then doing, and let's say moderating conversations on clubhouse or perhaps appearances on podcasts and for us, clubhouse is a, audio. I, we, we've been on clubhouse. Yeah. Yep. So you can come on clubhouse. We're doing something on the day you and I are taping this afternoon called hashtag. Is there enough hashtag agreement? what that's about. And a lot of those leaders that I mentioned are going to be on there today. Um, and it'll be available in replay by the time you put this out there. And uh, so Clubhouse is going to be restreamed over YouTube, Facebook Live. So it's almost like a live podcast, right? Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so that will be a forum. And we're building up an audience for the launch of a global media network around this. So we can really develop documentaries around this, some new written material around this. We even have some artificial intelligence tools to help this process. We, we're, we're quite tech savvy. And um, so, yeah, I think there's really endless opportunity by us focusing on the initial incremental examinations from other people's eyes, certainly besides mine for you, as to how do people look at this in this Rorschach test that you described it as. Um, it's quite revealing. Again, you have a much more detailed, broad view than I do. I am, um, I'm more nearsighted and I focus on, on the current details. So the meaningful coincidences are about individuals running into their environment, but it's also about global meaningful coincidences. Perhaps you're familiar with the idea of, of simultaneous independent discoveries where the same discovery is made by two different people who haven't had contact with each other. There's a lot of that. So I'm very much tuned to the global consciousness and I call it the psychosphere, our mental atmosphere, and that we exchange energy information through the psychosphere. And I'd like that to be something that's also considered in the world and perhaps in your world, because we need awareness of our awareness. 
<laughs> there are two people uh, in our world that you're likely going to want to interview. Uh, one is very recent in our world. His name is Robert Strock. Do you know Robert? Nope. Okay. He is the founder of the Global Bridge Foundation. He's a psycho an eminent psychologist of more than 50 years. Um, he sat on the board of the Buckminster Fuller Institute, and he has a concept called psychopolitics. Yeah. And I imagine the two of you would have a conversation that I would bring a big bowl of popcorn <laughs> to munch on while the two of you talk. Uh, right. Robert has interviewed me, and you can hear what he had to say about our conversation, but I think you'd find him a great guest. And then the person, I think, uh, who has some of the most unsung knowledge about transformation from an awareness perspective is Marsha Martin. That's marshamartin.com for your audience. And she's the woman behind the scenes of some of the greatest transformational leaders over the last 50 years. Um, many name brand people that a lot of your audience will know and have read and attended seminars of. And uh, Marsha is like a living history of the human transformation movement. And her ev evoking of the importance of awareness of awareness is greater than anybody I've come across before talking to you about that. And uh, I think you'd really enjoy. Having well, that's her. good, because I if you can talk about awareness of awareness, then you can talk about awareness of awareness of awareness. Yeah, as I said, you and Marsha will have a wonderful conversation. Because <laughs> I don't find too many people who can do that third one up there. That that that's that's the fun one. And that's where a lot of transformation can take place, because I think and that's just me, I think that to have awareness of awareness, awareness of the psychosphere, awareness of how this awareness operates can more efficiently accomplish the goals you're describing. We, <clears throat> as I felt for 30 years, have enough. And when we provoke the conversation of enough, we come to the realization that whatever we want to do about it is basically going to be war or agreement. Not war or peace, war or agreement. Peace is a byproduct of agreement. Prosperity is a byproduct of agreement. Justice is a byproduct of agreement. We human beings are terrible at it. Beautiful, beautiful. You know, where, where my heart rings with what you're talking about is the relationship thing uh, that I've tried to yell about how the problem we got is we don't get along with each other and it just doesn't get traction you're making the traction you're making the traction on it dan and thanks for doing that in such a global way because i you're right and you're there you got to do it i'm maybe can contribute to some of that of what you're no, doing you no I, <clears throat> I absolutely know you can and and i will promise you that when you dig into our history you will see we've had a real ear to the ground when people say you're not saying it right or you're not allowing me to speak or <laughs> get my ideas in or whatever it is we have forced ourselves in the pursuit of truth over our feelings to really listen carefully. And it has given us such golden stuff. I mean, when we break down what we're doing on a business level, I had a hundred million dollar huge idea and somebody gave me one little idea and it turned into a hundred billion dollar idea on that one listening. And the person that's, who was saying, I didn't want to hear what he had to say. So that, that, those, are the, those are the stories I want, man. Those are the stories I want. We, we, we have to stop. I got to go on to this next yes. podcast in a little bit. We'll keep in, we'll keep in contact because uh, you. you're, you're, do, you're doing God's work, whoever God is. You're doing it. The, you're doing what we need to be doing here and uh, i deeply respect it and appreciate the opportunity to talk with you you're very sweet thank you so much you're welcome this psychosphere is our mental atmosphere like a hologram of cosmic consciousness